Thank you. Uh, I am delighted to be here this morning, and I would like to begin by asking a question. Who here likes dinosaurs? <laughs> okay, I'll raise my hand. I think dinosaurs are extremely cool. Uh, my background is in physics, but I, like most people, I think dinosaurs are fascinating. And you go to these museums, and you see these uh, skeletons, and these are just magnificent, amazing creatures. Uh, they're just fascinating to look at. Um, and you, you wonder, it automatically raises questions in your mind about these creatures. Uh, for instance, uh, did dinosaurs evolve from other creatures? Now, that is something we are constantly being told uh, by the popular science as well as the media. Uh, did they live millions of years ago? Uh, did they rule the earth? Were they wiped out by a meteorite? I mean, that, that story is accepted almost as gospel by much of the world. Uh, but the question that a lot of Christians have is how do dinosaurs fit into the Bible? A lot of Christians are really uncomfortable with dinosaurs because they're not sure how dinosaurs fit into biblical history. So I'd like to give you this morning two simple rules that will help you make sense of dinosaurs. In fact, this is a good, these are good rules uh, when you're thinking about any topic. Uh, if you're wanting to try to develop a biblical worldview, first, you believe what the Bible says, and second, you follow the clues. So we're going to uh, elaborate first on that first point, believe the Bible, and we're going to go to Scripture and see if there's information in Scripture that might give us some clues about dinosaurs. And I think you might find that if we take Scripture seriously, and if we ignore for the time being what secular scientists say about dinosaurs, but we simply start with the Bible and believe what it says, you will find that the Bible has a lot more to say about dinosaurs than you might originally think. So a good place to begin would be in Genesis, where we're looking at the six days of creation, uh, these are ordinary 24-hour days. There's no good reason to believe that the, they represent long periods of time or that there's gaps between them. These are just regular 24-hour days. So the, an obvious question would be, on which day did God make dinosaurs? Well, before we answer that question, we've got to make sure that we can identify dinosaurs correctly. How do you know if an animal's a dinosaur? Okay, and it's not because it's really scary. <laughs> Okay, that's not the answer, okay? If it's a dinosaur, it's going to be a reptile, and its legs are going to go straight down. That's how you tell. That's how you tell if it's a dinosaur. The legs will go straight down. A lot, you know, for instance, if you have an alligator or crocodile, their legs kind of go out like this, and they kind of walk like this, okay? But dinosaurs, the legs go straight down. So let's see if you're paying attention. Is this a dinosaur? No. No, it's a mosasaur. It is, is a great aquatic reptile. The evolutionists would claim that it lived millions of years ago, but it's technically not a dinosaur. Uh, what about this one right here? What about a plesiosaur? Yes or no? Is it a dinosaur? No. That's right. It's not. It's not. Good. Uh, what about this one? What about a pteranodon? What about one of these flying creatures? Is this a dinosaur? No, that's right. A lot of times people will mistakenly refer to it as a dinosaur, but technically it's not. But these are swimming and flying creatures. And the Bible tells us on which day God made those. He made those on day five. So if we take Scripture at face value, the flying and swimming creatures would have been created on the fifth day of creation week, including these aquatic reptiles and uh, these flying reptiles. But dinosaurs are land animals. So the obvious question would be, on which day did God make the land animals? So how many know the answer to that? Which day did God make the land animals? Day six, that's right. It was day six. And whom else did he make on day six? That's exactly right. He made the first man and woman. So if we believe Scripture, if we start with Scripture without being influenced by outside ideas from secular scientists, we would conclude right from the beginning that people and dinosaurs were on the earth at the same time. Okay, so we've already learned something very significant from Scripture. There was no age of dinosaurs where dinosaurs ruled the earth. People and dinosaurs 
were in fact on the earth at the same time. So another question that we have is, did dinosaurs evolve? Well, Scripture answers that question for us. We read in Genesis chapter 1, verse 25, God said, well, actually it says, and God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And based on that and other verses of Scripture, it's clear that God created these animals to reproduce after their kinds. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means you're not going to have a uh, fish uh, having offspring that is a frog. You're not going to have um, uh, a lizard turning into a bird, okay? Because these creatures reproduce after their kind, that makes evolution impossible, right? Because, it, because in order for evolution to be true, animals, at least some of the time, have to not reproduce after their kind. They have to change radically from one basic kind of animal into another. Now, yes, there, is, there are changes, okay? You can have big dogs and small dogs, and you can have dogs that have long hair and short hair, but they're still dogs, okay? There's, there's variation, but it's always within fixed limits. So this is telling us from Scripture that dinosaurs did not evolve from other kinds of creatures. In fact, no creatures evolved from simpler forms of life. Now, this agrees very well with, with, with what we see uh, from the, the scientific evidence, particularly the fossils that we want to talk about a little bit later. This fellow right here is Dr. David Weishampel, and he is, was the lead editor of an encyclopedic reference on dinosaurs ca called the Dinosauria. And this is what he said about the dinosaurs and about trying to find ancestors for the dinosaurs. He said, from my reading of the fossil record of dinosaurs, no direct ancestors have been discovered for any dinosaur species. Alas, my list of dinosaurian ancestors is an empty one. So here is a world-class expert on dinosaurs acknowledging he doesn't see any evidence that they evolved from other creatures. Here is Dr. Paul Sereno. He's at the University of Chicago. He said this. He said, early on again, I think researchers and even maybe lay people really felt that we had more ancestors in the fossil record than we actually do. We don't have a lot of ancestors, we have a lot of twigs. Okay, so these dinosaurs did not evolve, and you will hear a lot of evolutionists try to make this argument that dinosaurs ultimately, or at least some of the dinosaurs, evolved into birds. That didn't happen either. In fact, there's huge anatomical problems with having dinosaurs evolve into birds. Okay, so remember what we're trying to do here. We're trying to think biblically about dinosaurs. And one question that might naturally come to your mind is, what did dinosaurs eat, particularly before Adam and Eve sinned? Well, Scripture gives us a very important clue. Uh, Genesis 1.25, God said also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. So that means that when God originally made his very good creation, there were no meat eaters, okay? Everyone were, was vegetarian, including Adam and Eve. So the dinosaurs were originally plant eaters, including this fellow right here, <laughs> okay? Okay, yeah, he looks scary, but sometimes you have animals that have sharp teeth that use those sharp teeth for things other than meat, uh, the fruit bat, for instance, it has sharp teeth, but it eats fruit, okay? So uh, just because it has these sharp teeth does not necessarily mean uh, that it was using it to kill other animals. Now, later on, it did. We know that these T. rexes eventually became carnivores uh, by the time of the flood. There's evidence that by the t by eventually, by the time of the flood, they were carnivores, uh, but they would have started out as vegetarians, by the way, uh, this is something I don't know if you've ever thought about, uh, but just to impress on you how badly we messed up when we disobeyed the Lord. Uh, kids, do you realize that if Adam and Eve had not sinned, you could have had a pet dinosaur? Really? You could have had a pet dinosaur. Uh, yeah. You could have had one, okay? Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty cool. But unfortunately, we disobeyed the Lord, and so 
Uh, that didn't happen. Okay, so that first rule is believe the Bible, and the second rule is follow the clues. So let's think logically about dinosaurs, and let's take what we've learned from Scripture and think through this logically. First of all, how do we even know dinosaurs existed? Well, one way we know they existed is because we have their remains. We have these fossils, uh, these remains, um, their remains in these rocks. We find them all over the world, and... uh, these are the remains of dead animals. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about death. Uh, what does the Bible say about death? In Romans 5, Paul tells us this. He says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. So we know from Scripture that death, it, certainly human death, entered the world as a result of Adam's sin. But we would argue, biblical creationists would argue, it wasn't just human death, it was animal death as well. Because God originally said that his creation was very good. And it's very hard to see how an animal, a world that had death and suffering could be described as being very good. And remember also, the dinosaurs originally ate plants. That really doesn't make sense if you believe there was animal death in the world before Adam sinned. Furthermore, we're told in Romans chapter 8, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So when you look at Scripture, you look at both the testimony of Scripture and the Old and New Testaments, it's clear that death and suffering, both human and animal suffering, entered the world because of Adam's sin. All right, now where do we find these dinosaur fossils? Well, we find them in what are are called sedimentary rocks. And these rocks are deposited when material is laid down by moving water. Uh, Even the secular scientists acknowledge that nearly all the sedimentary rocks are water deposited, although they will try to argue that a large fraction of them were deposited under tranquil conditions. Uh, We think there's good evidence against that. But even they acknowledge that around 99 to 95% of these sedimentary rocks were water deposited. And in them, we find remains of these dead animals that were buried catastrophically. You often have their bones jumbled together. Many dinosaur fossils, the heads have been ripped off. Uh, There is a very uh, well-known T-Rex fossil that was discovered where basically the head was just almost folded over onto the pelvis. Okay, so we're talking about violent, destructive death. So is there an event in the Bible that can explain the fossils? And it's got to meet two conditions, right? It's got to occur after Adam sinned, because these are the remains of, these fossils are the remains of dead animals. So whenever this event occurred, it had to have occurred after Adam sinned, and it has to involve a lot of water. Well, I think we can, I think... You all can pretty much guess what that event is, and it's the Genesis flood. So we are arguing that when you look at these dinosaur fossils, you are looking at the remains of creatures that perished in the Genesis flood. And we would argue that nearly all the fossils are from the flood. There's a few that are from after the flood. Uh, There was a little bit of catastrophism after the flood, but the vast, vast majority are from the flood. And there are places, for instance, we... (laughs) Dallas, Texas, where ICR is located, used to be underwater. They find mosasaur fossils that, you know, these creatures are around 45 feet long. These are aquatic reptiles. We find them in Texas, inland. Why is that? Uh, We also find them uh, up here in the Great Plains, these fossils. Well, it's because the world was flooded, exactly as Scripture tells us. And by the way, these fossils will often, con- well, let me, let me, they, they contradict the evolutionary story. And if you carefully look at the evolutionary literature, you will see examples where they, they kind of admit this themselves. Now, what this is, what I've drawn here is I've drawn something called the geologic time scale. And this is from a textbook that I used in graduate school back in 1997. And so uh, you can see what, what we have is what they, um, they call the, Phanerozoic eon, uh, you've got what is called the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, the Cenozoic. You know, this is where the dinosaurs are supposed to have lived. And these numbers here are millions of years. 
So this Jurassic period is supposed to have occurred, it, it was between 208 and 144 million years ago. Now, the numbers have changed a little bit since then, but not a whole lot. And here's the point I want to make to you. This textbook made some very dogmatic claims about when certain creatures appeared. For instance, they claimed that the first flowering plants occurred in what is called the Cretaceous. Well, guess what? They're now, well, they also claimed that the first dinosaurs were found in the Triassic, and that is still the conventional um, thinking. Now, we are arguing uh, that these do not represent vast periods of time. These are simply flood deposits, okay? Now, remember what I said about they claimed that the first flowering plants were in the Cretaceous. Well, now they're saying, well, oops, we messed up. Uh, they, these, uh, uh, these flowers may have been present when the first dinosaurs appeared. That would have been earlier in what they call uh, the Triassic. Okay, so they're now saying, well, these plants came about 100 million years ago earlier than they were previously claiming. Now, here's another example. Uh, they're again claiming that the very first birds and mammals occurred in the Jurassic. Okay, again, that's supposed to be 208 to 144 million years ago. Now, what I want to do now is I want to read you a quote that was from the Smithsonian Magazine. Okay, the magazine published by the, the, the Smithsonian Institution. And they were, discover, they were describing these um, fossil discoveries that had been ma made by an amateur paleontologist. And these were not bone fossils, but these were tracks that had been found in what you call Permian strata. Okay? Now remember, okay, Permian is down here. This is supposed to be older than the very first dinosaurs. And remember, you're supposed to have the first birds and mammals here. And this is what this article from the, from the Smithsonian Magazine said. The fossil tracks that McDonald has collected include a number of what paleontologists like to call problematic. Okay, that means it's a problem for them. Okay, you can see where this is going. On one trackway, for example, a three-toed creature apparently took a few steps, then disappeared as though it took off and flew. We don't know of any three-toed animals in the Permian, McDonald points out, and there aren't supposed to be any birds. He's got several tracks where creatures appear to be walking on their hind legs, others that look almost simian or ape-like. Now remember, these are Permian tracks. These are supposed to be before even the first dinosaurs. On one pair of siltstone tablets, I noticed some unusually large, deep, and scary-looking footprints each with five arched toe marks like nails. I comment that they look just like bear tracks. Yeah, McDonald says reluctantly, they sure do. Mammals evolved long after the Permian period, scientists agree, yet, yet these tracks are clearly Permian. Do you see the problem here? Okay, they're claiming the first birds and mammals showed up in the Jurassic, and then you had the first dinosaurs here, but it looks like, based on these tracks, you've got birds, apes, and bears walking around before even the first dinosaurs. And that is a problem if you believe in this evolutionary story. Now, creationists, we do believe that there is a general trend in the fossil record, okay? But this is not a, it's not a, a, a time sequence so much as is, is, is a burial sequence. It's a flood sequence, okay? There's a general trend because you had the, the shallow uh, seas, uh, you would have had those creatures buried first, then the waters would have gone farther and further inland, and they would have covered different areas, different ecological niches, if you will. Uh, and so there's going to be a trend. There is a rough trend, but there's also going to be exceptions, and those exceptions are problems for the evolutionists. So we're saying that these fossils are creatures that perished in the flood, and we know that God told Noah to take on the ark representatives of all the air-breathing, land-dwelling animals. Now, let's think about this for a second. Those all the, are those dinosaurs air-breathing, land-dwelling animals? Yes. And God told them to take representatives of, of all those land-dwelling, air-breathing animals on the ark. So, if if, according to Scripture, we have to conclude that dinosaurs were, in fact, on the ark. And there's plenty of room. The ark was an enormous vessel. If you assume that the cubit, you know, the distance from your elbow to the your, uh, tip of your finger there, 
is 18 inches, which is pretty conservative. You know, the ark would have been about 450 feet long. The storage capacity would have been equivalent to about 522 railroad boxcars. Now, some people think the cubit is actually a little bit longer than that, and then it would have been even bigger. Uh, this is a model of Noah's Ark that we have on display at the Institute for Creation Research. And uh, here we have a train, a boxcar, and the scale is not quite exact, but it's pretty close. Okay, so that gives you a feel for just how big the ark actually was. And Noah did not have to take full-grown big dinosaurs on the ark. He would have probably taken smaller ones, younger ones, because remember... The point of taking those animals on the ark is so that they will reproduce and fill the earth after the flood. So you would naturally want younger dinosaurs to do that. And most dinosaurs weren't that big. Uh, in fact, Dr. Tim Clary and Dr. Jeff Tompkins at ICR have done some research that we think the median-sized uh, dinosaur is about the size of a buffalo. Okay, so most of these dinosaurs weren't big. They weren't that big. The ones that really were big, he probably took smaller ones, younger ones. In fact, that was probably the case for all of the dinosaurs. And uh, we think that evolutionists are overcounting the number of dinosaurs. We think there were probably about 50 to 60 Genesis kinds of dinosaurs, which means Noah would have only had to take about 100 to 120 dinosaurs on the ark. Now, let's put on our thinking caps. If dinosaurs were on the ark, then what happens after the flood? Well, they get off the ark, right? <laughs> okay, the dinosaurs get off the ark, they start moving out and they start filling the earth like God instructed them to. Okay, and that means, then we have the question is, well, if that's true, could it be that people may have encountered these dinosaurs after the flood? And if they did, did they write about them? Uh, or is there a chance that they may have recorded these encounters? Now, the evolutionists are adamant that no one has ever seen a living dinosaur. In fact, if you want to make an evolutionist really, really, really mad, just say that you think people and dinosaurs were on the earth at the same time. For some reason, that really seems to rub them the wrong way. They really don't like that. But nevertheless, that's what we're claiming. We are claiming that people and dinosaurs were on the earth at the same time. And if that's true, it's possible they might be mentioned in Scripture. Now, you're not going to see the word dinosaur in the Bible because the word dinosaur was not coined until 1841, but they could be described in Scripture under different names. And there is a lengthy description of an animal called the behemoth in the 40th chapter of Job, which we would argue is a dinosaur, probably one of the long-necked, long-tailed sauropod dinosaurs. And this is what the text says, Look now at the behemoth which I made along with you, he eats grass like an ox. Okay, so we know this creature is a vegetarian. We know it eats grass. By the way, evolutionists used to dogmatically insist that dinosaurs did not eat grass because grass did not evolve until millions of years after the dinosaurs went extinct. Well, we know now that we know now that's not true. And you know how we know? Well, we have some fossilized dinosaur poo. Okay, and guess what? There's fossilized grass in there. So we know they ate grass. Of course, the if the evolutionists had believed their Bibles, they would have already known that. Okay? And then the text goes on, and it says some other things. It says, see now his strength is in his hips, and his power in his, his stomach muscles. If you look at this, these large creatures, that is a very, adequate, a very good description. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. And I don't know of any other animal whose tail can reasonably be compared to that of a tree. Okay, cedar is a large tree. In fact, we now know that some of these dinosaurs, when they walked, the tail would sway back and forth, left and right, to help it balance. And so the tail is literally swaying like a tree. And that's exactly what this description is telling us. It says his bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. If you've ever looked at these big dinosaur bones up close, that is a very apt description. And then the Lord says, He is the first of the ways of God. Only he who made him can bring near his sword. Now, the Bible also talks about other uh, creatures. Um, it also talks about a great sea monster called Leviathan. And again, this may, it may not be a dinosaur per se, 
But whatever it is, it's clearly a monstrous dragon-like animal. And it's mentioned multiple places in Scripture. In fact, in Job 41, it actually says this is a fire-breathing animal, a literal fire-breathing dragon. Uh, We're we're not exactly sure what this creature was. Some think it might have been a super croc. Uh, Others think it was a mosasaurus. Uh, Dr. Tim Clary thinks maybe it was a spinosaurus because that particular dinosaur could swim. But whatever it was, it was clearly a dragon-like animal. In fact, dragons, if you look in the King James Version of the Bible, they're mentioned about 20 times in the Old Testament. Now, a lot of the newer translations will chicken out, and they will translate it as something else, like jackals. But if you look at these references, a lot of them cannot be referring to jackals because uh, these creatures are described as having reptilian characteristics. Um, uh, you know, some of them are aquatic uh, you know, they're described as being monstrous. They can devour you up. Uh, these are dragons, okay? They're not jackals. They're dragons. In fact, in the King James, as well as older translations, flying serpents are mentioned two places in Isaiah. And we know that there were flying serpents. Now, the evolutionists claim those flying serpents lived millions of years ago, <clears throat> but they really didn't. Uh, so we have all these references in Scripture to these these dragon-like animals. And we think that's where this idea of dragons is coming from and why so many cultures around the world have these persistent tales of dragons. Now, if you'd like to read some fascinating material on this, there's a great book called After the Flood. It's by Dr. Bill Cooper, and it's online. If you do a search for After the Flood, you will quickly pull it up. And it's really about the early history of the European peoples after the flood, And by the way, he actually traces some of these peoples all the way back to Noah through his son Japheth. But he's got three chapters that deal with dinosaurs. It's absolutely fascinating reading. You can access it freely on the internet, and so I would urge you to check that out. But not only did people write about these animals, they drew pictures of them. You would be stunned at how many pictures there are of dinosaurs from ancient peoples around the world. Uh, here we have one that's well-known, uh, Natural Bridges Monument. And this one's a little bit hard to see, so I've kind of, uh, well, actually, I didn't highlight it here. But if you look closely, you can see the long neck. You've got a long tail here, and you've got these legs coming down. It's a little bit, it's been worn a little bit, but even the evolutionists acknowledge this looks like a dinosaur. Here's another one from Cambodia. Kids, what does that look like to you? What kind of dinosaur does that look like to you? Anybody know? You got it. That's what it looks like to me. This one is from a temple in Cambodia. It's about 1,000 years old. Here's another one from the United Kingdom. There's a cathedral where they have a famous bishop who's been buried there, and they have these, these brass engravings around his tomb that are about 500 years old. And if you look at it... <laughs> I don't know about you, but those look like dinosaurs to me. Now, the heads have been worn down a little bit because people have been walking on it for 500 years, but it really does look like a dinosaur, uh, or actually two dinosaurs. Here's another example. Uh, By the way, the ones that I'm showing you are of undisputed authenticity. To the best of my knowledge, no one disputes these examples that I'm showing you. This one, if I'm not mistaken, is actually in the Louvre in Paris. Okay, but you have this Mesopotamian cylinder seal where they would roll it on clay and make these impressions. And you can see, you've got this long, I mean, it, that looks like a dead ringer for a sauropod dinosaur to me. And here's, here's the seal that results when you roll it out. Okay? Now, we've also got strong scientific evidence that these creatures did not live millions of years ago. There's a particular variety or isotope of the carbon atom called carbon-14 or radiocarbon and it decays away very quickly. In fact, uh, if you, even the best instruments on the planet should not be able to detect any radiocarbon in something that is more than, say, 100,000 years old. And actually, 100,000 years is being too generous. It's probably more like 70,000. But we'll just use 100,000 as a round number. Well, guess what? They have found repeatedly radiocarbon in dinosaur bones. In fact, Brian Thomas at the Institute for Creation Research has done some, re, uh, done some of his own testing on this, and we found all these examples of radiocarbon 
in dinosaur fossils that are supposed to be tens and even hundreds of millions of years old. That is a strong argument that these creatures did not live millions of years ago. But there's an even stronger scientific argument, and that involves the fact that we, we have been finding for about 20 years now original biomolecules in these dinosaur bones, things like proteins, uh, bone cells, things like that, um, red blood cells, red blood vessels. And these things, according to the chemistry, aren't supposed to be able to last even a million years, and yet they are in these bones that are supposed to be tens and hundreds of millions of years old. So what I want to do now is I want to show you a little video clip from the television show 60 Minutes where they interview a scientist named Mary Schweitzer who was the one who made this discovery uh, back in the 1990s. And so here, here's the, audio the video clip right here. Some fragments of the bone in acid to dissolve away the outermost layer of mineral. But the acid worked too fast and all the mineral dissolved away. Being a fossil, there should have been nothing left. But there was, and it was elastic, like living tissue. This is the piece. <gasps> no. She showed us video she took under the microscope. That's really what happened? Yes. That's the dinosaur yeah. bone? Without mineral now. That's what was left. It looked like the soft tissue she would have expected to find if it had been modern bone. This was impossible. This bone was 68 million years old. So you see this and you think, what? You say, I didn't you want say, to tell anybody. <laughs> that you'd be ridiculed, yes. right? And so I, I said to my technician, OK, do it again. I don't believe it. And yet, in sample after sample, they were there. Things that looked suspiciously like flexible, transparent blood vessels. She finally mustered the courage to tell Jack. She said she dissolved the bone away, and there were blood vessels. And you know, I was like, shocked. How Who could that be? How could that be? That's right. The things Mary was finding inside dinosaur bones, look at that, blood vessels, and even what seemed to be intact cells, pose a radical challenge to the existing rules of science, that organic material can't possibly survive even a million years, let alone 68 million. Mary, Jack, and their team published their... Okay, so you see the problem the evolutionists have? Uh, this stuff, the, these biomolecules cannot survive based on laboratory measurements. They cannot survive for millions of years, and yet there they are in these dinosaur bones. Now, of course, they're, they're, they're willing to question their own laboratory experiments, but not the idea of millions of years, because that is a sacred cow for them. That's the one thing they are not willing to question. Now, I, I don't know if you noticed, but when uh, Leslie Stahl was interviewing Jack Horner, and she goes, how can that be? And he goes, how can that be? He, did you notice he looked a little uncomfortable? I think it was because he was worried that some of those crazy creationists would grab that video clip and go around and show it to people to convince them that these dinosaurs did not live millions of years ago. Well, he's right, and that's exactly what we're going to do. These creatures did not live millions of years ago. So what eventually happened to the dinosaurs? Well, we think there was an ice age after the flood. And actually, if you were in, say, the Middle East, it would have probably been a very pleasant time. We think there was a lot more rainfall in the Middle East during that time. But after that, things start drying out, and the climate's going to be a lot harsher for these creatures. But also, people are going to hunt them down. People are, a lot of times, are going to be scared of these creatures. And we think in a lot of cases, we humans just killed them off, unfortunately. Okay? Uh, but, you know, there, there are these unconfirmed reports from different parts of the world about possible dinosaurs that might be, still be living in some remote places like uh, the Congo region of Africa or maybe Papua New Guinea. Nobody's got any hard evidence of this. Uh, but I don't know about you, but I think that'd be pretty cool if there were still, still some dinosaurs out there. I think that would be really neat. And uh, kids, it may not be too late uh, for you to have a pet dinosaur one day because when the Lord Jesus comes back, he's going to restore all things. And, it, you know, I, I actually, uh, Randy Alcorn, I think many of you are familiar with him, he makes a strong argument that there may actually be dinosaurs on the earth 
uh, during the millennium or maybe during the, the new heaven and earth. And his argument, which is, to me is a surprisingly strong argument, is that since God is going to restore all things, that since the dinosaurs would not have gone extinct had the fall not occurred, he may, may very well uh, bring them back. Or if they're not extinct yet, uh, maybe their numbers will increase. And maybe one of these days, you kids might actually be able to have a pet dinosaur. Okay, now, uh, what I want to do now is I want to show you a video clip uh, for um, a DVD series that we've made recently about dinosaurs, and it's really cool. So just pay attention and, and watch this little video clip right here. You know, dinosaurs are used more than just about any other topic to really inundate people with evolutionary thinking. He would assume that canyon required many years to form, but instead it was formed in a single day. Whoa, what have we got here? It seems to describe what the Bible is talking about when it talks about a global deluge. Part of this evolutionary story asserts that dinosaurs evolved into birds. We are not the product of evolution and we have not been here for millions of years. The discovery of soft tissues in dinosaur fossils sparked a revolution in paleontology. But there are indications in the fossils that this story doesn't add up. This is a great bit of evidence that points towards a young Earth, that these fossils are not millions of years old, but were buried only a few thousands of years ago. We see flood sediments pushed way up into these mountains. Tremendous upheaval was going on in the Earth. This is bigger than an asteroid. There's a consistent pattern of the water moving across continents, thousand feet or more above present sea level. We can use the truth about dinosaurs to show people that the Bible really is true from the very beginning. What happened to them? Did they slowly go extinct? Or was it something sudden, something global, cataclysmic? Can science answer these questions? Can the Bible unravel this mystery? Uncovering the truth about dinosaurs. So that's one resource on dinosaurs that we have. And again, how do we make sense of dinosaurs? We believe the Bible and we follow the clues. Uh, you, we, can, we have that out in the foyer if you'd like to uh, get this DVD series. Uh, we've got also a number of other resources. We have a book called Creation Basics and Beyond. And it is a really good book if you want answers uh, to a lot, basically general questions that people have about creation versus evolution. This is a good introductory handbook to give you ammunition to answer the skeptics. And one thing I'm really proud about this book is we cover a lot of the newer evolutionary arguments that aren't covered in some older books uh, of this type. And we've got a section in there on dinosaurs. So we answered your questions about dinosaurs. We also have the Guide to Creation Basics, which is Kind of like Creation Basics and Beyond, but it's uh, not quite as academic, but it's got lots of pretty pictures in it. And yes, it does talk about dinosaurs. Uh, we've, got, uh, two, we've got two other books on dinosaurs, um, one by Dr. Timothy Clary there on the left, Dinosaurs, uh, what was the subtitle there? I can't make it out. Uh, Wonders of God's Creation, I believe, is the subtitle. But uh, some people have said this is the best dinosaur book uh, from a creation perspective that's out there. We also have the Guide to Dinosaurs that was written by Dr. Clary and Brian Thomas. And we also have another DV on dinosaurs called Discovering Dinosaurs uh, that Brian Thomas uh, did. It's a really good talk uh, on dinosaurs, and kids really love it. Uh, Brian's really a great speaker. We also have a brand new children's book on dinosaurs that we've just produced, as well as another one called Dragons, Legends, and Lore of Dinosaurs. Uh, that one is also a children's book, but I can promise you that even if you're an adult, uh, an adult you will find it to be absolutely fascinating. Uh, we also have a free magazine, okay, again, that is free magazine called Acts and Facts. It comes to your house free every month if you sign up for it, and it is a glossy magazine and every month we answer questions that people have about creation versus evolution. Okay, so we talk about these things. We talk about dinosaurs, we talk about the flood, uh, we talk about the alleged ape men uh, that they claim were, er, an, uh, were our ancestors. So we're constantly addressing those kind of issues. 